Okay, this is Dr. Morton dictating uh, or recording a video for Logic Design for Wednesday, the 28th, October 28th. It's going to be a review video for the test coming up Friday. All right, uh, I, I went on a bit of a rant, but I deleted it, so I'm starting over. I don't want to rant, but what I want to say is I, I've had a lot of students that aren't, aren't doing the work. They're not, they're not showing up to do the test. They're not taking the quizzes. Uh, they're not looking at the videos, but I'm sure there's going to be an expectation to get a good grade at the end of the course. How's that going to work? I, I don't understand that thinking. Uh, you need to do the work if you expect to get a good grade. It's that simple. So this test is scheduled for Friday from 7 a.m. to midnight, actually 11.59 p.m. Take take the test on Friday. I don't want to hear next week, oh, I forgot to take the test. I will send out emails. I'll do everything I can to remind you. But you've got a whole, what, 7 to midnight, 7 a.m. to midnight. So it's way more than 12 hours. It's 12 hours plus uh, 5. So it's 17 hours to take the test. I'll even, hell, I'll, I'll let you start this tonight at midnight. Maybe I'll do that. I'll just open it up tonight at midnight. You can take it, you have 24 hours to take the test. There's no excuse, or not tonight, but Thursday night at midnight. So from, from all day Friday, I'll set it up that way. You can take it all day Friday. If you have problems with the test, you need to let me know right away with an email. And I'll try and I'll, if hopefully I'll see the email, but maybe I won't because I'm, sometimes I'm driving, sometimes I'm I'm in the lab helping Micro One students debug their code, so it, it just varies. But if I see the email, I'll try and deal with it as soon as I see it. But send me the email anyway to document in real time that you're having trouble. I don't want to hear next week, oh well, I couldn't see the test. That's not going to fly this time. Okay, so I know we're in COVID. I know, you know. It's off-putting, but you still have to do the work. If you're going to get a grade in this class, you have to do the work. Take the test. I don't want anybody giving me an excuse for why you can't take the test unless you give me an excuse before Friday. Then I'll think about it. I mean, well, I, I, I'll give you. If you have a medical emergency or something, fine. I get it. But the idea you just forgot, I... I I'm, I'm sorry. Don't just forget. Make a note. Okay, enough ranting. Wasn't as bad as my last rant. All right, so what I'm going to do today, I'm going to cover, uh, I'm going to work uh, review tests. Uh, and this will be very similar to the material that's on the test, but it will not be the same format. The format will be very much like test one. So you know you have to kind of cope with this format and I and I I know it's not the same it's a little difficult I get that but uh, but in some ways it's easier because I'm giving you choices so you kind of can validate that you probably worked it right all right so I'll have a, a sheet and it'll have figures on it and then what you'll do is refer to the figures and answer the questions now some of them you wait you may want to actually work out like the like like the copying a truth table into k-maps you're going to need to do that on pen and paper okay so print the test out or get 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 a blank sheet of scratch paper and just work on that but you will have to work it out but once you work it out then you should be able to do the test no problem keep track of your time you'll have 90 minutes that is plenty of time to do the test uh, if you just sat down and did it it you could probably easily do it in 35 or 40 minutes. But when I gave similar tests in the classroom, everybody got it done in 50 minutes. And I'm not giving you any more problems. So the only real complaint is that you have to wait for Blackboard to respond and you have to click on buttons and stuff. That does add a little bit of time. It doesn't add, it doesn't add uh, 40 minutes. Okay. It maybe adds 10 minutes. And since you could do it in 40 minutes, you still could get it done in 50 minutes. Um, all right. So, so make sure you do it. So I'm gonna, that's what I'm gonna do today is I'm, I'm gonna work these tests. Okay, so let me shrink this. Well, let me, let me flip this around actually. I'm gonna change the camera. And I may bring up the other program. We'll see, I'll probably do that. 
So you can, okay. So there's the first problem, uh, and then I'm gonna let me do this real quick. Let me stop this a second. Okay, so here's the problem. And uh, so it's realize a switching function using a mux. Label inputs to generate f, where f equals the sum of. Oh, crap. Uh, where f equals the sum of uh, m 0, 1, 3, 5, 7, 12, 13, 15. Okay, so first off, let's fill in the truth table for f. Okay, so 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, and then we have 15, not 14, 13, and 12. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8. And there aren't any don't cares, and that's fine. Okay, so now what we're going to do is we're going to use this 8 to 1 mux to do this. Now, how did I tell you to do this? If you do this just like I told you to do it, you'll be fine. If you don't, you'll probably struggle with it. The first thing is we want to take these independent variables and we want to connect them down here, A, B, C. Now, I know these are labeled A, B, C. I might, I might label these... Um, um, I might label these, um, what was the other, uh, I don't know, I, I forget. Uh, um, you, these could be, these could have any labels. They could have uh, X, Y, Z. Just because I put ABC doesn't mean that, you know, but in this case it does work out that way, so that's fine. So if I label them X, Y, Z, you still have to put ABC here. All right, now we have the four, the eight inputs, okay? Now, these, these ABC, these are the control lines. These select which one of these lines is connected to F. Now, uh, the way this works, there's four possible things you connect. Now, we still have our variable D, right? So there's four possible things you could connect to each line. You could connect, you connect VDD, which means that's just one. You could connect VSS, which is ground, equals ground, or that equals zero. And then you can connect D or D prime. Those are the, those are your four choices. How do you know which one to connect to I zero? Well, what you do is you draw, you divide every row up into pairs of rows, like that. And you look at these pairs of rows, and you decide, you look and see which one of these you have to put in here. So if both of the desired values for F, for both rows, because remember, for each pair of rows, A, B, and C are the same, only D changes. So if F is the same, regardless of D, if it's 1, then you're just going to put in the constant 1. If it's 0, 1, that's exactly what D is, so you just put in D. If it's 0, 1, you put in D again. Here, uh, it's 0, 1 again, so another D. Here, it's 0, 0, so now you just put in a 0. Here, it's 0, 0, you put in another 0. Here, it's 1 again, and here, it's 0, 1, which is another D. Now, if we'd had a situation where it had been 1, 0, you would have put in D prime. But we didn't have that situation. And that's, that's what that should look like. And then that gives you the output for F. Now this is very, very straightforward. Now notice for this problem, we only can have one function. If we had two functions, we'd have to have another multiplexer, another 8 to 1 mux. You can do any, any four variable function with an 8 to 1 mux, any three variable function with a 4 to 1 mux, any five variable function with a 16 to 1 mux, okay? So, so, and you just divide them, you divide the truth table up into pairs of rows, starting with zero and runs the first pair, two, threes, and x, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, and so forth. And then you look and you see what happens. If they're both one, it's VDD, it's one. 
If it's 0, 0, it's ground. If it's 0, 1, it's D. And if it's 1, 0, it's D prime. That's all there is to it. Make sure you put the independent variables into the select lines. Yeah, sometimes we call these cell cell uh, 2, cell 1, and cell 0. That's what we could label them. You have to then match up the variables. And they have to be hierarchically correct. Since A is the higher order variable, you have to put A first, then B, then C. Okay, so be sure and put in the ABC and put in the values and populate the truth table. You don't have to put in the zeros, just the ones. Zeros start making it a little crowded. All right, so that's that one. Let's look at the same thing, only using the 3 to 8 decoder. We already did look at the ROM. I did that on, I did that for Monday. So you can go back and look at that video. But um, before we tackle this, I'll pull that up. Let's see, do I, did I throw it away? I think I did. So let me pull it out of here. Oh, maybe I can't find it. Hmm. Uh, all right, hang on. We'll pause the video for a second. Yeah, so here's the here's the ROM. Now you notice on the ROM we actually had one, two, three, four different functions because all we have to do in the ROM to implement a different function is to put in another column. Um, now that does increase, you know, increases the size of the ROM, but 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 just by, in this case, uh, just by uh, 16 bits. So, uh, as opposed to if you had another independent variable, you double the size of the ROM. Okay, so anyway, uh, we take these functions and we put them in here. Again, we get them pre presented the same way. Okay, we put them in here, just the ones, don't put the zeros in. And then we just map this directly into here as long as we get the address lines, A, B, C, D, lined up here, hierarchically correct. A3210, so A is A3, B is A2, C is A1, and D is A0. And then our outputs just have to line up with F1, F2, F3, F4. So output 0 is F1, output 1 is F2, output 2 is F3, and output 3 is F4. And then we just take the data exactly from these columns and put it into the ROM. And boom, the, when you present whatever A, B, C, D, R, the four values for the four functions for that particular row will pop right out the outputs. Done. Okay, so that's pretty straightforward. How many bits in this ROM? Well, four columns by 16 rows, four times 16 or 64 bits. All right, <clears throat> so that's that. Now, uh, okay, what about the 3D8 decoder? Well, the one thing about the 3D8 decoder is it, it takes an extra... Uh, component. It takes an OR gate. So realize the function f of x, y, z, three variable function using a three date decoder. So again, here we take x, y, z, and we put them in x, y, and z here. And then we have to populate f. So f is 0, 2, 5, 7. So 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 7. Now this is just a three variable function we would have to have a 4 to 16 decoder if we're going to do a four variable function. We do have a chip select here, but for this, we just have to pull this up to a VDD because we're going to keep it... Uh, sorry, this, this has to be pulled down to ground for it to be active. Yeah, so we pull it down to ground, that selects the chip. Um, okay, it's an active low chip select. All right, and um, so yeah, so we have to make the chip select zero when it's a not chip select, which makes chip select one. Yeah, it's confusing, grounded. That's all you have to remember. It's active low. Okay, now, so we have a three day decoder. What is our function? Our function has is F zero, so we need this one. Three, or I'm sorry, two, so we need this one, uh, five and seven, five and seven. So we take this output, we take the two, we take the five, and we take the seven, 
and we put a nice little OR gate in here and we drive it out to F. That is how we implement this function. Now, you 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 have to uh, you have to do you have to add the OR gate. So you can't do it with just the, the multiplexer. But <clears throat> but this is a nice easy way. Now, do you connect Y1 to anything? No, you don't. Because you want you don't want the OR gate putting out a one for Y1. You want it putting out a zero, and it will. So only one of these is ever going to light up at any given time. So if Y0 doesn't light up, Y2 doesn't light up, Y5 doesn't light up, and Y7 doesn't light up, then this OR gate will put out a zero for F. So that's perfect. You want zeros for Y1, Y3, Y4, and Y6, so you leave them unconnected. Now one of the things I see is somebody will come in here and draw lines and connect everything. Well, what, what would the point of that be? You might as well just connect F to 1 because it's always going to be 1. Unless, of course, your chip select is not active. But in this case, we, we make the chip select active all the time, and we just let the, we, we only select the, the, the lines that represent the min terms we want to include in the output function. We have to populate the truth table, and then we have to choose the right outputs and add an OR gate. That's all we have to do. Okay? So that one's real straightforward. Okay, let's back up, and I want to look at one more thing that I want to get covered for sure. And let's see what else. Yes, okay, so um, I think these are the uh, Yeah, these are the same. Oh, no, they aren't. Okay, so so we'll work a couple. Let's, let's work one that has a set, okay? So we're going to work this problem here, 10, that has a set. Okay, I'm going to move me out of the way because I'm blocking the view here. All right, so uh, I'll raise this up a little bit. And, oh, oops. Okay, so here's the problem using the D flip flop pictured. That's the D flip flop picture. We'll, we'll, we're going to take a good look at this D flip flop in a second. Write the tracing for Q in the timing diagram. Assume the, dis the delay for outputs to change after the active edge of the clock is 10 nanoseconds. Okay, so, so the clock's going to hit, but nothing's going to happen at that instant to the output. The output's not going to respond for 10 nanoseconds. All right, assume setup and hold times can be ignored. And that Q zero at and Q equals zero at T equals zero. Okay, so here's T zero. Q is here. Q is zero. All right. Now let's look at the flip flop. It's a D flip flop. It has what kind of a clock? It's got the carrot, so it's an edge clock, and it's got a bubble. That bubble can either be open or solid. Doesn't matter if it's filled in or if it's open. It's the same thing. Okay. So it's a falling edge clock because of the bubble. Now it also has a set. Is the set active high or active low? In this case, there's no bubble, so the set is active high. When the set is low, it's inactive, exerts no effect. When it's high, it forces the, the flip-flop into a set condition, and it does have a 10 nanosecond delay on it too, okay? But it is not synchronized with the clock. Whenever the set changes, then 10 nanoseconds later, the flip-flop will go to a set condition. When it, when the set goes high. All right. <clears throat> now we want to so we know the set is active when it's high. So what we're going to do is we're going to we're going to color in the active parts. So if if the set were low, we color in these parts, but since it's a high it's active high, no bubble, these are the areas where the set is active. And also here. Okay. The rest of the time, the set is inactive and has no effect on the flip-flop. Now, one more point, and this is another important point. When the set goes away, does that cause 10 nanoseconds later the output to go low? No, it does not. It leaves it in a set condition until the next active edge of the clock and the, and the next state of D, and only then 
will that determine whether it actually goes low or stays high? As long as the set's asserted after that small 10 nanosecond delay, it's going to keep the flip-flop in a high state and it's going to block any effect from, from the clock. All right, now, since it's a falling edge clock, we're going to go mark all of the falling edges. And maybe we should use a... If I have a red pen, we'll use that. Uh, maybe I don't... Oh, no, I... Okay, maybe I'll use a... I'll use a pencil. Okay, so here are all the falling edges. Now, one of the things that I should probably do where I have the set asserted, I'm just going to delete this because it doesn't have an effect here. It doesn't have an effect here either. It's blocked because of the active because of the active asynchronous input set. It affects here, no effect here. So now you see it we have an active edge here, here, not there, here, not here, not here and here. Now if you go through and mark those like this, you you'll avoid making the mistake of considering the clock when the set's asserted. When the set is asserted, you don't want to you want to ignore the clock. It's not going to have any effect. And now the only other thing we need to do is at every active edge, we should mark at that edge what D is. In this case, D is one. In this case, there's nothing. Nothing. In this case, D is zero. Nothing. In this case, D is one. And in this case, D is zero. So we have to deal with the clock and D here, 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 and here. And what do we know about a D flip-flop? We know whenever the clock edge, the active edge of the clock hits, whatever D is will propagate to the flip-flop and Q will follow. This is Q prime, that's Q. So if D is 1, Q will be 1. If D is 0, Q will be 0, regardless of what state it's in now. Okay? All right, so... So now all we have to do is fill in the trace for Q. We, we were told that Q starts at zero. Oh, one more thing. We do know that nothing's actually going to change on our active edge of the clock until, until right till 10 nanoseconds later. So it's actually not going to change until here. And it's actually not no, no edge, no edge. It's not going to actually change here until here. OK? And it's not actually going to change here until here and here until here. Now, same with the set. Here's the active edge of the set, but it's, uh, but it's actually not going to affect anything until here. And here's the edge of the set, but it's not going to affect anything until here. So, so these are the... We'll make these kind of dotted. So these are kind of the things where we need to sort of pay attention. Make it a kind of a dotted line there. Okay. All right. With the, armed with that, it's almost impossible to screw this up. So our Q starts here, and then we get to the clock here. D's one, so that means we're going to go set, but not for 10 nanoseconds. And now we go set. Now we're going to stay set. Oh, look. Now we have an active edge of this. Now we have the asynchronous input, the set. But all the set's going to do is keep it set. And nothing's going to happen then till we get to this next active edge of the clock, which is right there. The edge is here, but the actual takes effect here. And that, since the D's a zero, that's going down. Now we hit the set. We're going back up. We're going to stay up. Since that's a one, we're going to still stay up. And only here will we go back down. So this is, this is our tracing. And that's what it looks like. So it's low, high, a little notch down, high, and then it ends low. That's pretty straightforward. Okay. Let's do another one. Similar. We'll move things around just a little bit. Well, in this case, let's, even though I wrote it with a, I wrote it with a bubble, 
let's let's say this let's say there's no bubble here we'll just take off the bubble so now we have a rising edge so we'll mark and we have a active set let's make the set active low we'll put a bubble on the set so now we want to mark where the sets active well now now the sets going to be active in here active low So it's going to be asserted here. Uh, it's going to be asserted here, and if it starts off low, oh, and look, we have a 20 nanosecond propagation delay. So we have to take that in consideration. Okay. So now, since we have uh, active high edge, here's our active high, rising edge, I should say, rising edge, rising edge, rising edge, rising edge rising edge but here we have a set asserted so we don't have to consider the clock don't have to consider the clock we do here we don't here we don't here it's close but we'll say we don't uh, we don't here it's close again but and here so now the only clock edge we have to ever even think about is this one right here that's it and since we have a 10 nanosecond delay, we know we're going to take effect there. This is going to take effect here, but it's but it's already going to be uh, so so it's asserted here. So it, so we're going to go up here, and then we're going to stay till here. Here the D is zero, so we're going to go back to zero, and we're going to stay here until we get to this edge. 10 nanosecond, actually it's 20 nanoseconds. Sorry. So it's going to stay down here and then go up. I should change this to because it's 20 nanoseconds, not 10. And this one too. 20 nanoseconds, not 10. You have to read the problem, right? And then we're staying up here, but we missed this edge, so it doesn't really matter. And basically, there's nothing left. So we're staying high the rest of the time. So all we have is this one little notch there and this little starting notch, and that's it. Okay, so you just make sure you read it. You make sure you look at the flip-flop, and you make sure whether you have an active high or low clock, whether you have an active high or low set, or whether it's a set or a clear. If it's a clear, it's going to behave. It's going to force the flip-flop into a clear state. And then you only mark the edges where, where the asynchronous input's not asserted. Well, it's not asserted here, so that's that edge. And this edge just missed it, so we'll say it's not asserted anywhere in here. So basically, once you, once you go up, except for this little notch down, we're all the way back. And the only tricky thing was remembering 20 nanoseconds, so two of these spaces. And here we had to go from the active edge which was uh, right here, the active edge 10, 20. So it was actually right here, right? And then down here, uh, the active edge here, 10, 20. So it, it went back up here because of the asynchronous input. And it stayed up because uh, there, there were no edges in this time when the, when the set was was inactive high okay all right so that should ex that should deal with that all right now um, let me just go through the other bits of the test I don't know there's not much else to really talk here um, so so the first problem I really 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 hope that you're all over this first problem because this is really the meat and potatoes problem and I, I, I'm going to be sad if people have a lot of trouble with this first problem. You should not. All right. And, and I, again, you should work, you should solve the truth table, and then you should answer the questions, probably, or solve the, fill out the K-map. All right. In this case, it wants the max terms, the max term notation. So because it says notation, all we want are the numbers. If we said max terms, if we said the max term expression, then we would want... Uh, you know, A prime plus B prime plus C prime quantity times and so forth. But we don't have that. All right, so so this is, I, I always number them, 0, 
one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, fifteen. All right. So I know I have max terms two, three, four, five, six, seven. So two, three, four, five, six, seven. And then 12 and 13. 12 and 13. That's the max terms. I'm going to plot the min terms anyway. It says number the squares in the map. Okay, let's number the squares. This you should fall off a log and do. 0, 1. Flip the bottom two rows. 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, and 7. Skip the right two columns, or flip the right two columns. 8, 9, flip the rows, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15. Remember, you should always have 15 here and 7 here. If you do that, you know you're probably in good shape. All right, now let's plot them. 0, 1, 0, 1. We'll leave out the zeros. 8, 9, 10, 11. 8, 9, 10, 11, 14, 15. 14, 15. All right, so it's pretty obvious we can do this. We can do this. And we've got the column. That's it. Three two-variable terms, because each one is a four-box term, and it's a four-variable map. When you put four boxes together in a four-variable map, you've dropped two variables, and you only have two left. So what's this one? Well, it's A, it's B prime, C prime. Okay, what's this vertical column? It's A, B prime. And what's this group of four here? It's A, C. That's all there is to it. So that's the min terms. Now here it says determine the minimum POS form. Oh, so it doesn't want the SOP form, it wants POS. Well, you know that the SOP is the min terms and the POS are the max terms. So now we do need the zeros. Use this little map here. We'll put in the zeros and then we'll, we'll, we'll minimize it. Okay, that looks like what we've got. Well, dang swang. Look at that. And in fact, what we can see is that the SOP would be would be B prime C prime A C and the POS again we just we just write it as a min term and invert it. So if it were min term if these were ones we would call that A prime C. So therefore it's A plus C prime. And this would be A C prime so now it's going to be A prime plus C. So the final solution is A prime plus C times A plus C prime. And if we put it in SOP form, then it would just be B prime C prime plus AC. We do have a consensus term here, but we don't need it for the solution. You know what? I messed this one up. Uh, I missed it. Th these these are in the center. This is uh, this is B, not prime. It's B C, and this is uh, th it's B it's B prime. It's B prime C. So it's uh, yeah, it's B prime C. B prime plus C, A plus C prime. Yeah, I, I'm sorry, I couldn't see the lines. All right, so so that's what we've got. So this group is B prime plus C. This group is uh, A plus C prime. So B prime plus C, quantity times A plus C prime. That's the POS solution. And the SOP is just B, C, B, B prime C prime plus AC. Yeah. Now, one of the things that everybody tries to do is sometimes they try and take the SOP and invert it to get the POS. That isn't correct. That's totally false. But let's look at what it gives us just for grins. If we do this, what we're going to do is we're going to get B plus C quantity times A prime plus C. So look, these are different, right? 
b plus c instead of b prime plus c, and a prime plus c instead of a plus c prime. Yeah, it's kind of weird, but anyway, uh, that is what it gives. If we, if, so you can see these are not, they aren't, they're not equivalent, right? They're not equivalent. Oh, no, it's a prime c prime. Yeah, it's a prime c prime. Uh, hell, I don't know. Wh whatever. It is what it is. Yeah, it's a prime c prime. But in any event, that is not correct. That is not how you get from SOP to POS, because then they, they, are, they are the inverse of each other. All right. These, however, this expression here, B prime plus C quantity times A plus C prime equals this expression here, B prime C prime plus AC. And that B prime C prime plus AC. Those are exactly equal. One's in SOP form or POS form. One's in SOP form. Okay. Now let's look, uh, we'll look at some of the other parts of the thing. Um, all right. Where's my... Uh, okay. So, for pictured F, what kind of a flip-flop is this? Well, it's a D flip-flop. It has a, an active high set and it has a falling edge clock. So we'll say D flip-flop. What kind of a clock does this flip-flop use? Well, it's clearly a falling edge. Does this flip-flop have a clear knot input shown? No, it does not. Or well, you can circle it. Is the asynchronous input active high or low? It's active high. Given the following gates, show how to replace them. Okay, so this is an OR gate, so it's really easy. For, to replace this, you just need two R gates and then one R gate to put them into. And that does it. But this one, because it's a NOR gate, it's a little bit of a problem. So you, you, so you have one... These have to then go... These have to go through an inverter... And then they can go into the final OR gate. NOR gate, I should say. Two inputs here, two inputs here. So that gives you the equivalent of a four input NOR gate. Remember, you have to have the inverters in between. And the inverters, it's perfectly okay to use a NOR gate for an inverter. If you have a two input NOR gate, you can just tie them together and that makes it an inverter. But here, you don't have to put anything in between because you don't have the, this bubble on the end. And that bubble causes all sorts of problems. Okay. Um, let's see. What else? I, I probably won't ask you a question, but you should remember about the equivalent symbols. So let's, um, let's talk about that for a second. See, let me pull myself back up here. All right. Um, so you remember the equivalent sing signal symbols. For an AND gate, we can write an OR gate with bubbles on the inputs and the output. For an OR gate, we can write an AND gate with the bubbles on the input and the output. And for NAND and NOR, we can write the opposite gate, but only put bubbles on the inputs. So for a NAND, we write an OR, but only bubbles on the inputs. For a NOR, we write an AND, an AND gate, but only bubbles on the inputs. All right, so that's good. And then what about, what about, the, uh, what about the basic forms? Well, remember that we start in, we can start in this one form, SOP, and we can do double inversion, and we can make it NAND NAND by partially expanding. We expand a little more, we can make it OR NAND, a little more NOR OR, and finally, if we fully expand it, we're right back to where we started because double inversion doesn't actually change anything. Now, if we're in SOP form here and we want to put it in NOR NOR, the first thing we have to do is switch it to POS. And then 
use De Morgan's Law as partially expand a double inversion, and then we get the nor nor. Now, hopefully, all of you got some experience with this doing your projects, which is, of course, why I want you to do your projects. Um, and it will help you on the exam if you didn't. All right. I mean, if you did. Okay, so let's see if we have... Um, yeah, let's go back to this. Uh, I'm gonna, and we'll switch this back. Oh no, we won't make this get little. Okay, so let's see what we got here. Let's say here, starting with the POS form for F, put it in a form that would represent a two-layered net with nor nor gates. Well, fine. So here's our POS form, and we just do a double inversion partially expand the inner one and what that does that puts little tick marks here and it takes off this inner parenthesis and then it puts pluses in between these and that's nor nor form it's that simple okay so don't freak out all right uh this is just using just using Plotting, taking terms and plotting them. So let's do that. A, B, well, so this is, we know that, we know this is A, we know these two are B, we know these two are C, and we know these two are D. Okay? So A, B, so A is here and B is there, so that would just be four ones down here. A, B, C, D prime, so A, B, C D prime. So it would be it would be uh, here. Yeah, A B C D prime. So it's right there. So we've already put the one there. And since it's all four variables, it's only a single box. Here's three variables, so that'll be two box. B D C prime. B middle two columns. D middle two rows. So now you're down to these four. And uh, C prime, it's up here. So it's these two. And then finally, um, A prime, C prime, D. So A prime is these two columns. C prime is these four here. And D is going to be these two. You've already got that one there anyway. Because of here. Uh, no, that's wrong. Because of... Uh, yeah, because of B, B, D, C prime. Yeah. So here we are. So we only have, we only have, mid, so now, but now we're looking at the max terms. So we want to read out the max terms. So now we want to read out 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, or 4, 5, 6, 7, and then, 8, 9, 10, 11. And then 12, 13, 14, and 15 are not zeros. So that's it. So 0, 2, 3, 4, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11. So there's 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. So we should have uh, 6 of these. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. And that makes 16. So that's correct. Okay. All right, so, and then this is this is really straightforward, right? We're just drawing these. You don't really have to worry about the delays. Uh, if you want to write them in the center of the of the gate, you can. It's no big deal. Um, remember that we use the consensus term to fix the fix hazards. So here's this is the this is a good solution, but it might have a hazard. This would this term could be added to fix the hazard, but it. You see, you don't have to have it. It's a consensus term. Okay. Um, all right. I think that's I think that's probably mu pretty much it. All right. Um, yeah. All right. Um, so let's let's do the let's do this. What happened? There we are. Okay. So, um, all right. I, that covers most of it. I will try and do a little help session 
uh, on Thursday. I'll send out an email with the time. I'll probably do it maybe noon on Thursday, something like that. Or maybe I'll do it Thursday evening, if that would be better. Um, yeah, maybe I'll do it at 8 p.m. Thursday evening. How about that? So I'll, I'll do it thir 8 p.m. Thursday evening. I'll write myself a little note right now. And I'll use the same link that we had in... Uh, that we had in um, uh, for the office hours. So, um, okay, that was it, but we'll do four. Uh, 8 p.m. Thursday. Um, logic design help. So be sure and come to that if you think you might need a little help on the test. You probably won't be sad if you do. Uh, you might be sad if you don't. All right, we will see you then um, at the help session, and then be sure and do the test on Friday. All right, later.